Welcome back to the channel guys, hope everyone's doing well. Today we are looking at the new T-Deck Plus. I say new because this is actually the latest version of the T-Deck Plus. So for those of you that have used this before, you'll be aware of this device. Probably one that looks a bit more like this. So these look very similar, but this is the original version and it has a slightly different keyboard. So that's the first thing you notice about the new version of the Lidigo T-Deck Plus. And if we turn it on, you will also see that the, um, the keyboard has a backlight and that backlight turned on when I turned the device on. That doesn't happen on the other device. So we can see the most obvious change to this device is the keyboard. And I've got to say, I actually quite like this keyboard, this new one. Um, I actually got quite fast at typing on the sort of old school um, Blackberry style keyboard, but there isn't much button movement. And on this one, you actually kind of get quite a bit of, you know, you get quite a bit of button movement on there. So you can, you can hear it clicking, I don't know if you can hear that, but and you can actually type pretty fast on this keyboard, and that's that's obviously quite handy. Now there's so much activity happening on here um, in the Hartford area mesh. So the other change we can see on here, not so obvious, is this back panel here, which is no longer clear. Can you see this one here? It's got kind of loads of dirt and dust behind there because it's basically like clear. Um, plastic and then you've got like kind of a backing strip under there with the graphics on whereas this one has the graphics on the top this isn't actually a sticker this is kind of like permanently um, I don't know etched or something onto the plastic um, and that obviously means that you're not going to get the dust behind it and it just is a little bit more hard wearing it's the same at the bottom as well so it's kind of like you know feels a little bit more refined now the other thing is the trackball is actually kind of a little bit more recessed and that is a little bit of a problem because it doesn't kind of behave as nicely as the other one. You can see this here. My fingers are a little bit greasy, but yeah, this really isn't flying around as nice as I thought it would be now. Now, I don't know if this is my one in particular. I've only got one of these, so I can't really compare it um, to any others with this type of trackball, but I, had, I did notice that if you sort of clean this with um, a bit of isopropyl, it does actually speed up a bit. Um, and at the moment, I've got kind of greasy fingers, so it's, it's not performing that great. But the good thing about the user interface on this is it actually allows you to use the screen as an up and down so you can just kind of move up and down by touching the top and bottom of the screen. You can tap on the actual highlighted text as well and you can navigate just fine using that. So you don't even actually need to use that trackball anyway. And I've kind of got into just using this because actually it's just a lot easier using the touch screen really. So to kind of demonstrate this, I've got some isopropyl in here in this little glass cleaner bottle and I've cleaned the trackball and also my finger as well. So when you click on the button, you can see here, um, it's, it's pretty lively now. <laughs> so you can see here, it's actually kind of performing a lot better than, um, you know, it, it was doing before. So it's almost like, yeah, pretty good now. So yeah, when your fingers get a little bit sweaty, yeah, you might need to break out some isopropyl. <laughs> So that sort of covers the upgraded aesthetics on this. Nothing else has changed. We've still got the same battery, um, charge port, still a slowish charge on this one um, when you plug it into a USB-C port. Um, nothing else seems to have changed on here. You know, everything just looks exactly the same. So I haven't ripped this apart to see if anything inside has changed, um, but I haven't received any news that, you know, anything has. And these devices have just been shipped out. It was like a quiet update, just we've changed the keyboard. And if you have ordered one recently, you'll probably find you've got this keyboard. So onto the more software side of things, we're on version 7.4 now for this firmware. And there's a few changes that I'm going to sort of run through now, um, which are really good, actually. Some really, really cool, useful stuff that has been added. So the first one is in the Discover screen. So this is where you'll you obviously discover new repeaters, new nodes, new things you know that pop up onto the network. So you can see here, we've actually changed this section here, which used to have like 37 seconds ago and it took up quite a lot of space. So now it's not kind of getting caught up in the, you know, there's a little bit of text overrun. It's just one of those minor little details that should have been done sooner, but you know, because of other things happening, it, it hadn't been. Um, so that's that. Now, when you go into a discovered node, you can actually see the path of which the advert has been received from. So you can see here, we've got St Albans Omni, um, 15 kilometers away. And because that's a repeater, we can see that it's advert that it's sent out has come via a repeater with the ID 72. 
and then we can see here the ID CA. And CA is actually my repeat of one of my Yagis that I've got up here. So now I can see clearly how this station actually reached me, which is really, really smart. So you can see this one's got five hops here. And if we go into there, so we can see this is the entire route um, that's been taken. So I've got, there's a couple of my repeaters in there as well but it's it's really cool to be able to actually see and get a feel for you know how these stations have actually kind of reached you this is all stuff that's actually embedded in the mesh core packet so you know we can see how things are working in the background we just don't always show it on the um, on the app or the obviously this this um, T deck firmware so that's another really useful tool. Look, there's one with six hops here, and you can yeah you can go into this and work out exactly the route of that packet as taken, which is which is brilliant. So next up in the public channel messaging, we've now got a new feature in here as well. So basically now when you send a message in here, so I'm just going to say hello mesh for YouTube, and we'll probably get some people come back wanting to be funny in the YouTube. Uh, video. <laughs> um, so now if I send that out, so you can see here this little one has appeared and that means our message has been retransmitted by one repeater. So this is like a zero hop what this T-Deck has actually heard um, as a packet being retransmitted. So if you've got like two or three repeaters in, in the area, then it will actually kind of say that number of repeaters has repeated it. It's providing this T deck can actually hear those um, repeaters directly. I told you, so look, someone's coming back. So this is a really good way of seeing if you're actually getting a response when you're out and about and you use these devices. You never really know if something's kind of happening or not. So um, it's good to have these little numbers. Incidentally, you'll see when you kind of go out of the um, public channel and back in, those little boxes clear. I'm not sure if that's done on purpose yet to make this look cleaner or if it's kind of a, a quirk or something like that. But either way, it's really, really cool to see, you know, if your messages are going somewhere when you're out and about and you send a public message out, um, to know that your message has been repeated by something is, is really good. So other than that, we have some other features here which I'm going to come on to. This, this is something a little bit more um, advanced and something we've been playing around with in the background because I believe this is such an important thing um, to how the mesh operates and it's often overlooked. So... For example, if we go into my Yagi here, we can see here I'm already logged in. We get our, we get our telemetry back, and we see our little um, we see our little Wi-Fi bar at the top that shows we're connected um, to the repeater, or we can at least you know communicate with that repeater. Now, this is something I have talked about in in another video, um, but I'm going to sort of come onto it again. So if we do get stats, and we see we we can basically pull some stats from our repeater. Now, one of the things we've got in the stats now is a thing called noise floor. So you can see this noise floor level. Now that is basically showing you the noise floor at your repeater. What, what is noise floor? Noise floor is basically like the kind of ambient, think of it as like ambient radio noise that's coming into your antenna. So generally on this, a higher minus number is better. This is not particularly great. I'm seeing here on this particular repeater. Sometimes you have to refresh this to get an average. You can see here now it's a little bit more sensible. But this is really normal for this kind of ISM radio band that we're using for MeshCore. Um, it goes up and down and up and down. And it's just, yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening out there that isn't of interest to us, but it creates noise. And the noise is something that is going to, you can't get rid of because it's other people other people's transmissions but it will really impact your mesh if your noise floor is really bad so i've been able to check the noise floor of any repeater on the mesh which you can do here i can check this repeater i can check you know one of my other repeaters here as well like hartford omni if we just get the stats from here i noticed today it's pretty bad it's down at minus 96 normally it's about minus 110 so there's obviously something out there that's creating an extra bit of noise that my antenna's picking up so this is something yeah to be aware of and it doesn't only affect the repeaters it also affect, affects the devices themselves as well like this t deck and so to sort of demonstrate that i'm going to go into another screen here and show you the diagnostics screen so now once we're in this we can see out in the top right we've got noise floor minus 93 probably because i'm nearby screens and, and all sorts of other things it's probably come up a bit from from that but that's not too great considering you know we've got a little antenna 
in here, <laughs> underneath, inside the case. So you can see it's picking up minus 100 of noise, which is, you know, not, not a great noise floor, really. And now it's going right down as well. So, so you can see this sort of thing can cause us problems. You might remember from another video that there's a little green dot here that comes on and off, you know, over time. You see it flash just then. Now that is there to indicate not only a lower packet that comes in that's, that we want to decode, it also indicates noise as well. So I've showed you before just transmitting the, some noise on, um, on the band and it makes this um, little green light kind of come on. So that's a good indication. If you're sitting there and you've got this big solid green light that's just flashing all the time, then that is clearly not kind of proper lower activity. That's just going to be noise. Um, so that's a good thing to watch out for. If you see this on all the time, then there could be problems. There's also a bug within the radio system, and it's not to do with mesh call, we don't think. We think it's, it's generic across um, the board, where the radio can actually go into a lockup which we call death gate. You might have seen this on the Discord. Um, and basically what this does is when a slightly out of band signal comes in, it could be anything. If it's on a slightly different frequency, you might see this green light just turn on continuously. So whilst this bug is being sort of looked at by the um, guys that actually develop the radio kind of system that this works on, which is called Radio Lib. We've actually built in a way of mitigating this problem, um, and that is under the optimize menu here. So what we're particularly interested in is this one here, AGC reset interval. So if you're finding you're getting frequent radio lockups, so you can use this setting here to actually reset the AGC of the radio chip um, on an interval. So you could set it, if you're finding that this is a problem, frequent problem that you're getting where you're getting lockups, you could say set this to like, you know, every 60 seconds or something, and it will reset that and break your radio out of that kind of lockup phase. And that's how we're dealing with it at the moment. Um, and it has been working so far, but these are kind of experimental settings. So play with them and kind of, you know, get a feel for if it's actually helping you and let us know as well. Because obviously, you know, this is developing very, very quickly and um, your feedback is, is um, really important. The other one here is the interference threshold. That is kind of like a bit like a squelch, really. So the default setting for the interference threshold, we've actually set at 14. So if you go into this, it'll probably say 14 on yours. I've reduced mine to five because I'm aware of a signal in my area that I've kind of checked with an SDR. It turns out to be a streetlight control transmitter or something like that um, that's about a kilometre away on the top of a lamppost, surprisingly enough. Um, and it kind of transmits every like 20, 25 seconds for about five seconds. And while during that time, it, it kind of wipes out my receive, my reception. So what I've done here is I've set this interference threshold to five so that it triggers on this internal um, antenna in my house. So every time this, this kind of transmission happens, it makes the green light come on on the radio. So again, a bit like a squelch, it's reduced that level um, so that the green light comes on when it hears that, that street light transmitter. And during that time, this radio won't transmit so by delaying the transmit of this T-deck until you know the transmission from the streetlight thing is finished, it means there's more chance of me hearing uh, any reply coming back from whatever I'm trying to communicate with because the streetlight transmission's finished for that time and then there's clear air happening. So if you want to know more about that, watch the video. I think it's like two videos back um, where I'll show you this on the SDR and show you this, the sort of uh, the streetlight transmitter and what it's what it's doing on the SDR. It's quite interesting stuff this guys. It's a big big rabbit hole. Um, but it will make your mesh work a lot better once you understand this kind of these principles. So onto some other new settings we've got here. There's a, now a new setting under GPS location, which is basically allowing your telemetry for home contact. So anything on your home screen, you can actually kind of allow those um, those contacts to actually, um, you know, get a location from your device. And obviously there's other ones here as well. Allow all, allow broadcast. Um, you can deny it all as well. I'm actually just going to set mine to all so anyone can query my, my location and come and hassle me and tell me my videos are crap. <laughs> 
Right, so the next new feature we've got is in the map view. So you can see this is the map view. These are the received nodes in the area. You can see here. But what we've got now is we've got this extra menu down the bottom. And when you click on that, you can go into a, a tracks menu. So this is a bit like a, a GPS unit where you can kind of save your tracks. Like if you're out hiking, you can save um, tracks and also load them. So to start a new track, you can just hit up here, hit record new, and it will record your route and then you can basically see that on the map um, so now if we go to one that i've kind of done earlier and load that so you can see here the start and end time and date of the track and the total distance so this was like a one-way track where i was just testing this out in the car so if we load this we can actually see here we've also got elevation so you've got elevation view here as well down the bottom and you can tap on this to basically see um, you know if we zoom out on here uh, if you tap on that elevation view you'll actually see you know where that high point is so this is actually really cool for kind of doing some um, tests of your area you know for radio purposes you could actually kind of use this to uh, find out your local high points and find out where you know if you're sort of driving about you can see where the where the higher points are so that's pretty neat i like that feature as well as being used for a um like an old school gps tracker where you can just like kind of track your routes completely independent of the internet and everything else you're just doing this completely on the device which i absolutely love obviously you could use this for all sorts of things like cycling running all that kind of stuff and because these tracks are saved on the sd card you put in your t-deck you can actually access them on the computer by going to the ripple stroke trk folder and you can see it right there so we're just going to copy that out onto our computer because one of the guys from our discord called mr ben has actually made a conversion tool to convert these into kml or g GPX files. So you can see here we can just load one in and we can upload and decide what we want to do. So there you go, there's the route, and you can basically download that as a KML or um, I think we've got GPX down the bottom here as well. So really cool stuff, the community coming together again on Meshcore and giving us some great stuff to play with. So getting to the end of the video now, I want to come onto one other thing which I haven't mentioned before, but it has been around for a long time. This is incredibly cool. So basically, if you flash the version of the firmware that basically stores everything uh, from your device on the SD card, so on our flasher there's a, an SD card variant of the firmware, basically when you put an SD card in your device, it will become your SIM card effectively. So then you can put that SD card in another device. It's got to be flashed with the, the SD card version of, of the software and this will become this device. So you can move your IDs around. See here, I've got Launcher on here as well. I'll, I'll cover that in another video. But So now we can see this device is now using the same ID as this one was. So you can just move between devices. If you get a new T-Deck or you get another um, device that's running this um, software like the excellent t lower pager which i featured a couple of videos ago you can seamlessly move your id and all your settings contact list the whole lot from one device to the other super easy so that brings us to the end of the video hope you've enjoyed this one as usual links to these devices and the mesh website are in the description below let us know what you think in the comments like and subscribe and i'll catch you next time